Mr. Chairman, members of the hearing committee. In March of 2006, Michael Nifong was the appointed district attorney of Durham. He was engaged Let me in a- stop you right there. Yes, sir. You may need to speak up a okay. little bit. Okay. He was engaged in a contentious political campaign to keep his office. On Friday, March the 24th, Mr. Nifong learned for the first time that an African-American exotic dancer had alleged that she was raped by three white men at 610 North Buchanan Boulevard in Durham. That is a house that is rented by three team captains of the Duke lacrosse team. By the time Mr. Nifong learned about this allegation, the Durham Police Department working with Mr. Nifong's office had obtained non-testimonial identification orders from the court requiring that all 46 Caucasian members of the Duke lacrosse team provide DNA samples and be photographed for identification purposes. When Mr. Nifong saw that this case existed, he immediately recognized that this case would likely garner significant media attention and decided to handle it himself, instead of having the case handled by the assistant in his office who would ordinarily handle such cases. Mr. Nifong called the Durham Police Department, notified the Durham Police Department he would be handling the case himself, and instructed the Durham Police Department to go through him for any directions on the factual investigation of the case. Mr. Nifong also made an appointment to meet with investigator, investigator Hyman and Sergeant Gottlieb of the Durham Police Department on the following Monday. So he learned about this on Friday the 24th and um, had a meeting the following Monday with the police department. <clears throat> At that meeting, he was briefed by investigator Hyman and Sergeant Gottlieb. And he learned a lot about the case. He learned that the accusing party Crystal Mangum had given a number of different versions of what had happened on this night and in fact had twice recanted and said that no rape occurred at all. She had alleged variously that she had been assaulted by three or five or twenty men. Mr. Nifong learned that the other exotic dancer who was present at the party called the entire story a crock. He learned that the three team captains of the Duke lacrosse team who lived in the house where this allegedly happened had voluntarily provided DNA samples for comparison purposes, had voluntarily given statements to the police, and had cooperated in the police with, when the police executed a search warrant at the house. And he learned that those three team captains denied entirely Ms. Mangum's allegations. Mr. Nifong did not review all of the evidence that was available. He reviewed some of the evidence that was available. And he left that, that briefing and proceeded on a series of television and newspaper interviews, appeared on television, appeared on local television, appeared on national television, and said a number of things about this case. I won't go through all of them, but he made appearances on all of the local television shows. He made appearances on the MSNBC television program Rita Cosby Live, on Fox News, on CNN, on The O'Reilly Factor, on ESPN and on Dan Abrams' show, just to name a few. And in these interviews, he said, the cross players are not cooperating with the investigation. When asked about the three captains who had given these voluntary statements and provided DNA, he said, well, that would be considered cooperating, but if any of their statements are not truthful, that would not be cooperating. And when he was asked by the interviewer, well, are, are you aware of any statements made by any of those three men that are false? He said, well, they say a sexual assault didn't occur, and we don't think that's true. So therefore, they're not cooperating. He said that the Duke lacrosse players who had not voluntarily given statements were remaining silent on the advice of their counsel. And he said that may be good legal advice, but it's not good moral advice. He said, if these Duke lacrosse players haven't done anything wrong, why, one wonders why they would need lawyers. He detailed Ms. Mangum's allegations on national television repeatedly as if they were established facts. He expressed his personal belief in the truth of Ms. Mangum's allegations. He went on national television and demonstrated the chokehold that the lacrosse player who allegedly assaulted her had allegedly put on her neck. Allegedly put on her neck. Described how she struggled to breathe during the alleged attack. Stated that he was confident a sexual assault took place in that house said, quote, I'm convinced there was a rape, yes, sir, close quote. He stated that he believed a crime had been occurred, had, had, had occurred. He stated that the guilty will stand trial, and there's no doubt a sexual assault took place. He 
He talked about this being a crime that was motivated by racial hostility and hatred. He described racial slurs that allegedly were, were made during the alleged attack. He said that this was a crime that would not be tolerated in Durham. He called the perpetrators hooligans. He characterized the alleged crime as abhorrent, reprehensible, and absolutely unconscionable. He said this is a case that talks about what this community stands for. He threatened to bring aiding and abetting charges against any of the Duke lacrosse players who didn't come forward and give a statement. He said that he was personally appalled by the conduct that had been displayed here. He said this was the worst thing that had happened in Durham since he became the district attorney. He compared it to a quadruple, quadruple homicide and to multiple cross burnings. And he said at a public forum, I'm not going to let Durham's view in the mind of the world to be a bunch of lacrosse players from Duke raping a black girl from Durham. Now, either before he began make, giving these interviews or during the time he was giving these interviews, Mr. Nifong met with Investigator Hyman and Sergeant Gottlieb and acknowledged to them that there were serious problems with this case, but he continued making the statements. On the night of the alleged attack, Ms. Mangum was taken to Duke University Hospital where swabs were taken from her body for evidence purposes. Um, some of her clothing was collected and other evidence that had been collected was, was all sent to the SBI lab for testing. Um, partially to determine if there was any DNA on any of this evidence that could be uh, used for comparison purposes. On March the 30th, Mr. Nifong spoke with SBI representatives on the telephone and was told by them that their testing had revealed the presence of no DNA on any of those evidence items. Either that day or the next day, Mr. Nifong told reporters on film, on television, that that he expected to receive the results of the SBI testing next week. He gave the reporters and therefore the public the impression that no one knew whether the SBI reports, uh, excuse me, SBI testing would show the presence of DNA or not. He then went on television and he began to talk about if there isn't any DNA, it doesn't matter, that doesn't mean a crime didn't occur, it just means nothing was left behind. Because a condom might have been used. He made several statements on national television that you would not expect to find DNA if a condom was used. At the time Mr. Nifong made these statements to the reporters, which were broadcast throughout the nation about condoms, Mr. Nifong knew that Ms. Mangum had told the nurse who interviewed and examined her on the night of the alleged attack that there was no condom used. Ms. Mangum had said that none of them used a condom and at least some of them ejaculated. Ms. Ms. Uh, Mangum had been shown two photo arrays, and one of them had a picture of David Evans, who ultimately was indicted in this case. She was unable to pick out any of the alleged attackers. Mr. Nifong suggested that they take the 46 photographs that were, that were obtained pursuant to the non-testimonial identification order and show those to Ms. Mangum and instruct her before she looked at the photographs that every photograph she would look at was of a person who the police had reason to believe were present at the party. In other words, you can't make a wrong ID here. And in fact, Ms. Mangum did identify Reed Seligman and Colin Finnerty with a 100% certainty as two of the men who had attacked her. And she identified David Evans with a 90% certainty as the other man who had attacked her. That identification array happened on April the 4th. 